my uh, um, wife every year gives me books that she says I can use in my talks when I go out and speak. Uh, um, my favorite, my absolute favorite, is a guy who went around with a camera and took pictures of epitaphs, both in England and in the United States. And it really shows what people end up remembering and what they don't. It's a delightful book. And these are my three favorites from that book. Uh, and it talks something about long-term memory, which is where we're going uh, uh, for the next seven minutes or so. Okay, here's, here's one. In 1890 in Ohio, it says this. Blown upward, outward, out of sight, he sought the leak by candlelight. <laughs> <laughs> Annapolis, Maryland. Here lies Jane Smith, wife of Thomas Smith, town marble cutter. This monument erected by her husband as a tribute to her memory. Loving epitaph. Little line on it, and in tiny little letters chiseled right below it, monuments of this style can be had at the price of $250. <laughs> in Kentish Town, the Philip Glass of all epitaphs, you see, I told you I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> so the question you can ask is, after you have started to get multiple reinstatements of memory going, and, you've been, and you're starting to pop things out of working memory, and you've begun to recruit things for long-term storage, a really terrific question you can ask is, how long does it take until finally it sticks. How long does it take before the memory is now infinitely retrievable and not subject to corruption at retrieval? Does it take a couple of days? Does it take a couple of weeks? How long does it take before memory gets stuck once you have created a reinstatement schedule for it? The answer is extraordinary and is maybe one of the most counterintuitive things in the book. It's called systems consolidation and ladies and gentlemen, it takes years. In fact, a decade is an unusual. If you are HM, one of the most famous of all the surgical mistakes in cognitive neuroscience land, it's 11.3 years before it finds its happy hunting ground. While it is going, while, while it is journeying somewhere in your brain, we have no idea where it goes. In fact, Joseph Ledoux, my idea of a great uh, neuroscientist, calls it nomadic memory. Because while it is floating around there for X number of years trying to systems consolidate, it goes somewhere, but we have no idea where it goes. We actually know what happens when it stops and finally reaches its happy hunting ground. And I would like to show you this biology as we conclude this evening, and then I'll read just a quick something from the book. To do that, we have to do just a tiny little bit of brain biology, and just biology in general, and I, I will keep to the uh, uh, third grade teacher and business component of this, but the generalized routing pattern when information is coming into your brain uh, it starts from your sensory system and goes into the brain. So here's your nervous system. Sensory receptors pick up information and send it to the central nervous system. Goes over to the brain. And once it gets to the brain, it's not finished, certainly. The brain will actually begin to route it. The, the slide here says the brain distributes the incoming information to various processing centers uh, uh, in the brain. And that includes the cortex. I'm going to talk to you about the cortex in just a second. First, I will review the hippocampus. Cortex, by the way, literally means bark. It's the outer surface of the brain. Let's talk about two regions to understand this 10-year journey business. Only two brain areas we'll discuss, honest, and you've heard this one before. Let's just take a look at the hippocampus here. Uh, uh, we're mid-sagittal slice, and now we're going to go right in, and there's the hippocampus. And as we discussed earlier, the hippocampus converts short-term memory into long-term memory. That's one brain region we need to understand this story. The other brain region we need to understand is that cortex. So let's go back out of the brain and all the complex regions that lie to the interior and instead just discuss its surface. And on the surface, we have designated specific areas, which we call lobes. But the cortex itself is only about two millimeters thick. It's got six layers of cells. It's very thin. And yet, most of the actions that make us human are involved in there. And we give these lobes certain names. This back thing is called the occipital lobe. This thing that looks sort of like a hairband is the parietal lobe. This thing in the front is the frontal lobe. And the stuff that's around your ears, where you put your earmuffs on, is called the temporal lobe. Look, you guys. I have reinserted the hippocampus into that drawing so that you can see that the hippocampus is connected to the outside. The best electrical connections, wiring connections. The best way you can think of it, can you visualize a sparkler inside a brain? Yeah. Freeze the sparkler. You got it. Okay. Hippocampus to the outside. Those are the necessary and sufficient ideas to understand the 10-year journey. Let's get started on this. I have divided, these are, these are Medina phases to try and make this a little easier, but the references are here. This is the journey of a memory trace. 
Here's our hippocampus below, and we're going to start it at the point where the memory trace has gotten into the cortex after it's been routed through the brain and is now uh, towards the surface. What begins to happen? So start phase. Input is encoded into sensory cortex. So this is going to be our input. These are the neurons that are going to encode whatever piece of information is supposed to come in. And it immediately goes to what I call the alert phase, because almost immediately, the brain surface telegraphs the hippocampus that something has happened. And electrical connections and relationships begin to be established with the hippocampus. Back and forth they go. Back and forth they go. The hippocampus and the cortex now set up an electrical relationship that is going back and forth between them for years. Here it is. This is Joseph Ledoux's term, nomadic phase of memory. Number three, nomadic phase. Conversion from short term to long term takes place. Memory wanders. We have no idea. Electrical connection established? Absolutely. The hippocampus and cortex are talking to each other for years. But eventually, the, all the fine chatter ends. And at the very end, what in something that we don't fully understand at all, but it's sometimes called final phase, the memory finds its final happy hunting ground. The hippocampus says, OK, I'm done. Your memory's cooked and formed, and the hippocampus lets go, and now the memory is fully stable. We have no idea why it does that. We have an idea why it takes so long, but in all cases, it predicts something else about school systems, in my opinion. What if, if you could tear it all down and start it all over again, maybe given this unbelievable requirements of active repetition over and over again, and oh, I might tell you, by the way, while it's on its maybe decades-long journey, it is fully amendable and subject to corruption, okay? So that what reaches its final ha happy hunting ground may not be the input that was initial. Maybe if we obviated the idea of grades and instead started to think of knowledge, pieces of knowledge that need to be memorized, the same way we think of immune booster shots, we would then be giving booster shots throughout the course of the years as a kid goes to school. Because if this model is correct, what you learned in first grade isn't fully consolidated until you are a sophomore in high school. <laughs> yeah. Here. This is what this looks like to me. Here we go. A way to rethink the grade system? I don't know. Brain scientists and education scientists don't get together very often. But if they did, these are the kinds of things that might loosen up the ideas a little bit. Do you see where this is going? It's just a reimagining. But if we got first grade, and we'll go through sixth grade, maybe here's something for a booster shot. Yep, here's a booster shot. Ooh, my gosh, these are multiplication tables. Why don't we learn those? Here's the fractions that we're going to need from fourth grade on. Why don't we have a continual scheme of booster shots so that this thing has a chance for course correction during its 10-year journey? I don't know if this would work or not. But it seems to me to be more a series of testable ideas that could be shown to ask and answer the question, should we begin to reimagine the education system more along the lines of brain science? Um, one thing I do, especially in the College of Engineering, is that I've sometimes taught in the math lab. Sometimes I want to teach Fourier transforms, but what I end up having to teach is first-year calculus. Sometimes I try to teach first-year calculus to kids that are just coming in, and you know what I end up teaching? High school algebra, because they forgot it all. I have worked with Boeing on a number of occasions where they have asked the question, John, is there any way to improve the declarative information stream in the people we are hiring fresh out of colleges of engineering? Because they seem to have forgotten a lot. And, I'll, and I say to them, everybody forgets a lot. What if you did in a business setting something like this? If you had a four-year institution, how about the same booster shot idea? Only now the university begins to partner with the workforce, and you continue university instruction at the first year of hire, whereby you are repeating all of that information over and over and over again. I don't know. Education systems and business systems and brain science systems, would they all get together? It's just a fantasy. I live in an ivory tower, and I'm fully aware of that. This idea has no basis in reality. But again, the book is simply an, a, an attempt at reimagining. If you had a shot at reimagining, what might you come up with if you didn't come up with the full system?